Did the Trojan War really happen? Well, yes and no, but mostly no. <laughs> The story of the Trojan War is one of the best-known ancient Greek myths. The Trojan War Cycle is a collection of stories, poems, plays and artworks covering the saga of the war from its very beginnings when the Trojan Prince Paris was asked which of three goddesses was the most beautiful and inevitably pissed off the other two when he chose one of them, to its very end when Odysseus ruthlessly slaughtered all the men he came home to find hanging around about his house and trying to marry his wife. Most of these stories are deliberately rewritten in each retelling. Greek poets and playwrights would rewrite elements of their myths for dramatic effect. And because Greek religion was not a religion of the book, it was not dogmatic, it didn't have a canonical this is our founding mythology to it. So it was perfectly fine with everybody for poets and playwrights and writers to make up their own stories about gods and heroes. So the story of the Trojan War is an ever-changing collection of interconnected stories that are being retold and retold and changed in the retelling. But the ancient Greeks did believe that the Trojan War was an historical event that had really happened. Herodotus is often known as the father of history because his histories, which is a very large history of the Persian Wars between Greece and Persia, gives the whole subject its name. <laughs> he says in his prologue, this is the verification of the investigation, and that's the word historiae that gives us our word history. The investigation of Herodotus of Halicarnassus. Neither the deeds of men may be forgotten by lapse of time, nor the works great and marvellous which have been produced some by Greeks and some by barbarians should lose their fame, and specifically for what cause they fought with one another. Although his principal subject is the Persian Wars that took place between 490 and 479 BCE, between Persia and the Greek city-states, he actually includes all sorts of other things in his histories. It's a very, very large collection. It's got the whole kind of history and culture of Egypt in there in book two. Um, he's got all sorts of things in his histories. He doesn't stick to just that specific subject. And he opens the entire history with a series of wars caused by people abducting other people's wives and daughters, including, of course, Helen of Troy. Helen of Troy is actually the Queen of Sparta at the beginning of the story. She is the wife of Menelaus, the king of Sparta, and then she somehow ends up in Troy with the Trojan prince Paris, who's also sometimes called Alexander. In some versions she's abducted, in some versions she's seduced um, because of the Greek view that women would be very easily seduced by men, that women are uh, very susceptible to any man turning up and wanting them and they, they just go. Um, in some versions she falls in love with Paris and goes willingly. It depends entirely on the author. There are some versions that Herodotus actually talks about where Helen doesn't go to Troy at all. A uh, shade of Helen is taken to Troy by Paris and Helen herself is actually in Egypt the entire time. This is partly because Helen ends up back with Menelaus at the end of the war, and whereas most other people's marriages and home lives have been completely broken by this long war, Helen and Menelaus, the causes of it, are fine. And they, they sort of live happily ever after. <laughs> It's quite strange. And this is one of the ways that authors try to explain this oddity of the story. The reason Paris feels entitled to Helen, by the way, is because she is his prize for having chosen Aphrodite as the most beautiful of the three goddesses, Aphrodite, Hera and Athena, in the aforementioned Judgment of Paris. Helen is the most beautiful woman in the world. She's his prize. So according to the Trojan War mythic cycle, this is the cause of the war, that Paris has abducted, seduced, whatever, Helen, um, and taken her away, and Menelaus goes to war to get her back. In some versions, he doesn't necessarily want her back. In some of them, he's planning not to let her survive either, although obviously they do end up back together in the end. Um, but to deal with this affront um, to his honour. There's also another backstory where loads of different Greek heroes wanted to marry Helen because she is the most beautiful woman in the world, um, and they all competed, and Menelaus won, but during the process where they were all trying to marry her, uh, they all vowed to uphold the right of whoever ended up married to her to be her husband. And that's why everybody else gets dragged into the war, because they had all vowed that they would uphold Menelaus's marriage to Helen. And so when Helen is taken away, um, 
where they all have to help Menelaus get her back, or at least avenge the abduction. Now, of course, Herodotus includes a lot of things in his history. <laughs> there's a phoenix in there. There's a great story about giant gold-digging ants, which may or may not have been inspired by the real-life animal that is the camel spider. Do not Google that if you are afraid of spiders. You have been warned. Just because something is in Herodotus does not mean it's a real historical event. <laughs> um, especially something that would have happened so much longer ago. Herodotus is writing in the 5th century BCE. His main subject is wars that happened just before and around the time he was born. But the Trojan War, if it really happened, would have happened about 1200, maybe 1100 BCE, way back in the Bronze Age. It's centuries and centuries earlier. So even considering Herodotus may be more reliable for some of the more recent stuff, just because Herodotus said something happened hundreds and hundreds of years ago certainly doesn't mean that it did. <laughs> The earliest versions of the Trojan War story are the Homeric poems. This is the Iliad and the Odyssey. They are both attributed to a poet called Homer. There is lots of debate about whether the same person wrote both of them, whether multiple people wrote both of them, and nobody really knows. Uh, we don't know for sure exactly if it was one person or two people or more people who wrote down these poems. Uh, but Homer is the name attributed to whoever wrote these poems down in antiquity, so for the sake of simplicity we go with that. They are based on oral tradition. So these are stories that had been passed down orally from bard to bard, poet to poet, for a long, long time, pr probably centuries until somebody decided to write them down. The Iliad tells a story that takes place during the siege of Troy. So, the Greeks all go over to get Helen back, uh, but Troy is famous for having impenetrable walls, and so they settle in for a siege that ends up lasting ten years. The action of the Iliad takes place in the kind of last year or thereabouts of the war, and it doesn't actually involve any of the kind of major events from the Trojan War cycle. It kind of plays a mini version of some of the Trojan War cycle. So the action of the Iliad is kicked off when Agamemnon steals a slave girl from Achilles, and Achilles gets mad and refuses to fight, and then uh, Achilles probably lover Patroclus goes and fights, and Patroclus gets killed, and then Achilles is really upset, and then he goes and kills the Trojan prince Hector to avenge Patroclus. And that's kind of the action of the Iliad. So it doesn't actually feature the kind of main points of the Trojan War cycle. It, it's before the horse and after the original kind of departure and beginning of the war. But it's a story set within that war. The Odyssey is about the return home of Odysseus. So there are lots of stories about the various nostoi, that's the uh, homeward journeys, the returns home, of the various Greek heroes, or at least the ones that survived. Odysseus's is the most famous and the longest because it takes Odysseus another 10 years to get home. So his baby son is 20 years old, more than 20, and starting to think he should take over the kingdom by the time Odysseus gets back. The Odyssey is most famous for Odysseus's adventures with the Sirens and Scylla and Charybdis and the Underworld and Circe the Witch and all that stuff. That's actually only three chapters out of 24 in the Odyssey. Um, a lot of the rest of it is about Odysseus getting home, killing all the men trying to marry his wife, about what's been going on with his son while he's away, and with Penelope, his wife. Um, he gets captured by a nymph called Calypso for quite a while, he goes and has dinner with some Nausicaans. There's a lot in the poem. These two poems are the closest that Greek mythology gets to having a canonical text. So while authors are generally happy to play around with the stories as much as they want, stuff that's in Homer is as close as they get to going, oh no, Homer says this, so that's how it is. They can still mess with it, and some do, um, but it is definitely less common to mess with something that's in Homer. They are not only the oldest texts relating to the Trojan War, or indeed Greek mythology as a whole, they're actually the oldest texts in European literature. There are older texts from other places, <laughs> the Epic of Gilgamesh from the Near East. I know very little about China, but I'm pretty sure they've got some older stuff as well. <laughs> but in terms of European literature, the Homeric poems are the oldest texts we have. So. If the Trojan War is an historical event, these are the closest to it in terms of when they were written down, but they were still transmitted orally for centuries first, and they're not histories like Herodotus. He's called the father of history for a reason. It didn't exist before him, at least not in European literature. The Homeric poems are poems, and they are primarily intended to be artistic, even if they do record some true events. <laughs> 
The theory of oral poetry was developed by Wilman Parry and Albert Lord in the 1930s. They compared ancient poetry to orally transmitted poems in what was at the time Yugoslavia, and they found certain features in Homeric poetry that matched the use of epithets in what was Yugoslavian. Slavic, of various kinds, poetry. This is things like descriptions of Achilles as swift-footed Achilles, descriptions of the wine-dark sea, and historians of wet blood trying to work out why they describe the Mediterranean as the colour of wine, by the way. There are various theories. Hector of the flashing helm, all this kind of thing. These epithets are indications of an oral composition, because what they realised the Yugoslavian poets were doing is they hadn't memorised a really long poem, which is what people had thought was going on before. What they were doing is they knew the stories, they knew the basic shape and outline, and then they were composing as they go. They knew the rhythm and the meter that they needed to follow, and they were yeah, improvising, making it up as they go along. It would be slightly different every time. And you can use the epithets to make the lines work out right, to have the right rhythm, the right meter, the right rhyme scheme, whatever you're going for. Um, you can put an epithet in or leave it out, uh, depending on what the sentence is doing. It's a way of helping in that composition as you go. And we can see those epithets in the written versions of the Homeric poems. So this was Parry and Lord's theory, is that the Homeric poems must have been derived from oral tradition, because we can see these epithets, and that they were composed as they were sung, until whatever point somebody decided to write these two down. And these are probably collections of a few uh, poems as well, because if you sat down and tried to sing the whole of the Iliad in one night, that would be a very, very long night. For unfortunately, my uh, physical copies of the Homeric poems I've left in the office at work, so I can't show them to you. Um, but they're extremely long poems. So the likelihood is that there is either a real history or at least a story <laughs> that has come into being somewhere, um, and that that tradition, that story, has been passed on through centuries of oral tradition. But details will be changed in each retelling. The shape of the story will stay roughly the same, but the details, the specifics, the nuances will change because each bard will change and compose the story anew as they sing it. So with this type of poetry, we then have a question. We've got poems describing events that took place many centuries earlier. They're then transmitted orally throughout that period of those centuries from whenever the event originally took place to the point that the poem is written down. And then they are written down and then set in stone, uh, particularly in the case of Homer, at a specific point in time. In the case of the Homeric poems, sometime between 800 and 600 BCE, we're not sure exactly when. I think maybe closer to 800, but there's no way of really knowing for sure. So, are the poems an accurate transmission of the history of the original event? Are they a reflection of cultural history at the time they're written down, but not much else? Or are they a mix of everything, with all little bits from the period in between as well? You could make an argument for any of those. Most likely there's a little bit of everything in there. <laughs> There'll be cultural elements from the point they're written down. There'll be little bits and pieces that have crept in throughout the intervening centuries through the oral tradition. And there'll be some kind of core, some kernel of it, that comes from the original events, or at least from the first time the poems are sung. The problem for our question, did the Trojan War really happen, is that the problem for our question, did the Trojan War really happen, is that when we look at other examples where we know a bit more about the historical event and we have an orally derived poem about it, the similarities between the event itself and the poem are not very many. Moses Finley used a medieval French poem as an example of this. The Song of Roland is a French poem about an attack led by Charlemagne in the early medieval period. The actual battle that it is about took place in 778 CE. The earliest known text of the Song of Roland is from about 1150 CE. So it's not a dissimilar gap from the gap between the Trojan War, assuming it happened, and the Homeric poems. We have a bit more information about the historical events that inspired the poem. We have uh, a bit more in terms of textual sources and other sources for that period, so we know a bit more about the original battle um, than we do about the Trojan War. Moses Finley said that basically the atmosphere, the cultural atmosphere of the poem, reflects more or less the time it was written down or slightly earlier. 
The political geography of the poem reflects a period somewhere in the middle, <laughs> around the 10th century CE, and he said it had retained exactly three facts from the actual historical events of 778. Charlemagne led an expedition to Spain, it ended badly, and one of the men killed was called Roland. And that's it. And everything else in the poem is basically fiction. So that doesn't bode well for our question about the Trojan War. It does rather imply that no, the Trojan War didn't really happen, or at least not in the way it's described by our sources. By the time the Homeric poems are written down, the chances that they've retained much factual information about a war that happened centuries earlier are pretty slim, especially because they are not intended to be history, they are intended to be poetry. Now, of course, many cultures do preserve their history through poetry, that's absolutely true, but if we're looking at how accurate are the facts, then any poetic method of preserving history is only going to keep the bare bones. It is not going to be accurate to the nuances and the details of what's happening, because the aim of a poet is primarily, first and foremost, the artistry of the poem. So we really can't rely on the Homeric poems for the details of the story of the Trojan War. But that doesn't mean that it's completely unhistorical or completely fictional and there's no history in it whatsoever. For one thing, there are descriptions in the Homeric poems of things that were genuinely in use at the time the war would have happened in the Bronze Age, and the descriptions of these things have survived the oral transmission of the poems, and they are genuine Mycenaean artefacts, battle tactics and politics. Most of these examples come from the Iliad, partly because the Iliad is the poem concerned with the war itself, whereas the Odyssey is about Odysseus' return home. The basic setup of the story matches what we know of Greek Bronze Age history. This period in Greek history is referred to as the Mycenaean period. It is named after the city-state of Mycenae, which was one of the richest and most powerful city-states in that period. Mycenae is the city-state that Agamemnon is meant to be king of in the story. And we know from the archaeological evidence that Mycenae really was a very rich and powerful city at that time. Sparta was fairly important as well, which is where Menelaus is king of. So the basic setup of the kings of Mycenae and Sparta leading an alliance of Greek states in an attack on Troy, which is in modern Turkey, does make sense. There's also a section of the Iliad called the Catalogue of Ships. This comes early in the poem. If you ever want to read the Iliad, it is a really interesting poem, it's fascinating, um, but I would recommend you skip the catalogue of ships unless you're really, really interested in Mycenaean archaeology. Um, it is what it sounds like. Um, it's a list of all the ships from all the various city-states and kingdoms that sent soldiers to Troy. Um, it's really boring. <laughs> Not the whole Iliad, just the catalogue of ships is really boring. Um, but very useful, because it names all these various states and kingdoms. Some of them continued to be influential and important into the classical period after the Homeric poems were written down, like Sparta. But some of them were important big cities, big states in the Mycenaean period, but had become much smaller and much less influential by the time you get to the point the poems are written down and then on into the classical period. Pylos, for example, was not rebuilt after the destructions that ended the Mycenaean period. Uh, basically, not long after the Trojan War would have happened, um, a lot of Mycenaean cities seemed to have been destroyed and the population collapsed. And again, we don't really know why, we don't know what happened, some kind of invasion from people from the sea or barbarians from the north. Barbarians. I've turned into an ancient Greek. Um, people from the north. Uh, the Greek language actually doesn't appear until the Homeric poems, several centuries later. The language of Mycenaean Greece is a language we refer to as Linear B, um, which has some connections with Greek, but it isn't Greek. Um, Greek appears at some point in this period in between the Mycenaean period and Homer. Homeric poems. So probably some kind of invasion by people who were speaking Greek is most likely. <laughs> uh, when I was an undergrad I used to joke that it must have been giant aliens. Uh, but I don't really think it was aliens, I think that's important to establish. So Pylos was not rebuilt after this invasion uh, and destruction period, but it is mentioned in the catalogue of ships in Greek in the Homeric poems. Uh, so obviously the poems have preserved some genuine Mycenaean history. There are a few artefacts that are described in the poems that seem to match um, archaeological finds. For example, Homer's description of Nestor's cup. Nestor is an old man who is one of the Greeks. It is described as a beauteous cup that the old man had brought from home, studded with bosses of gold. It had four handles, and about each handle two doves were feeding and below were two supports. 
Another man could barely have lifted that cup from the table. This description seems very similar to a gold cup found at Mycenae in a shaft grave. Mycenae, where Agamemnon is supposed to be from, and one of the richest and most powerful states in the Mycenaean period, hence we named the whole period after it. <laughs> Another example of an item that seems to match a description from Homer is the boar's tusk helmet worn by the hero Meriones. Homer describes the helmet as a helm wrought of hide with many a tight stretched thong that made it stiff within. Without the white teeth of a boar of gleaming tusks were set thick on this side and that, well and cunningly and in it was a lining of felt. And this description seems to match another find from Mycenae, a boar's tusk helmet found in another tomb at Mycenae and now in the National Archaeological Museum at Athens. Homer also describes uh, one of the two Ajaxes, um, there's two Ajaxes in uh, the story of the Trojan War, as carrying a shield that was like a tower made of bronze with seven layers, each one of ox hide. The description of a tower-shaped shield seems to match a gold ring from Mycenae that shows a man carrying a very, very tall tower-shaped shield. Other shapes of shield are also available and also described in the poems and match some frescoes from Mycenae. He describes Hector's shield as well balanced on every side, thick with hides where abundant bronze had been welded. So what we think is that well balanced on every side means that it was in this sort of figure of eight shape, that it's, it's kind of a double circle joined together. And this matches some shields we see in frescoes from Mycenae. And again, you can see these in the National Archaeological Museum at Athens now. These figure of eight shields seem to match the description of Hector's shield in the poem. There's also lots of descriptions of battle chariots in Homer, which also matches some Mycenaean and Bronze Age pots, which show people going into war in battle chariots. Homer doesn't seem to quite know how to use them. They all ride their chariots into war and then get out. So the artifact has been remembered, but the use of it hasn't quite. Um, but it does seem to be another of these survivals, things that are real parts of Mycenaean history that we can see in the archeological record and that have genuinely been preserved in Homeric poems. Troy itself is very much a real place, just like Mycenae and Sparta. There was a site in modern Turkey, what is now Turkey, uh, that was identified as Troy throughout the ancient world and which apparently had the graves of both Achilles and Patroclus, the heroes of the Trojan War. It was visited by both Alexander the Great and later Julius Caesar. However, we're not sure exactly where that place was and there is no modern place that has graves of Achilles and Patroclus in it, wherever that was, has been destroyed. But there is a real ancient city, an archeological site that is usually identified as Troy. It is the Hittite city of Wailusha. The Hittite empire was a major Western Asian empire that flourished between about 1650 and 1180 BCE. Place names can survive for a long time, even after the language has fallen into disuse. We see that in many places around the world. And the name of Troy in uh, ancient literature is actually more often Ilion or Ilium which is probably a corruption of Wileon, Willian. The inhabitants are Troes, named after Tros, a mythical ancestor. So Troy isn't actually the name of the place, at least not in the ancient world. Um, the Troes, the Trojans, are named after their ancestor Tros, but the place is Ilion or Willian or Wileon. Troisa and Wailusha are place names from Asia Minor which appear in Hittite records. There's also a record mentioning the city of Wailusha being ruled by somebody called Alexandus, which is especially interesting because of Paris's other name, Alexander. There's also a record of conflict between a Greek king and a Hittite king over Wailusha. So this is sounding very much like the Trojan War. We've got a conflict between a Greek king and a Hittite king involving this specific city and this site. Again, exactly which modern site is the ancient Hittite city of Wailusha is debated. But since the 19th century, there has been a site that has regularly been identified as Troy slash Wailusha. It is Hisalik in Turkey. This was excavated by Heinrich Schliemann. Schliemann is quite a character in the history of archeology. span He was a polyglot who spoke 13 languages and he had made a bunch of money in the gold rush in California, buying and selling gold. He also had excellent taste in top hats and fur coats. This is my favourite photo of Heinrich Schliemann. He is the person who excavated Mycenae, or at least who first excavated Mycenae. He found this gold death mask of a Bronze Age Mycenaean king, and he said, I have looked upon the face of Agamemnon. Now, 
whether or not it's Agamemnon. It's not the only death mask from Mycenae, so how you would identify this specific one as Agamemnon anyway, even if Agamemnon's a real person. Um, but it certainly does confirm just how rich and powerful a state Mycenae was. He was brought to the site believed to be Troy in 1870 by Frank Calvert. Schliemann then attacked his Arlick looking for evidence of ancient Troy. Now, of course, archaeological sites usually have the more recent stuff on the top, and then the most ancient stuff is near the bottom because the kind of deposits building up over time. And sites have long and rich histories uh, beyond whatever is the most famous thing that's happened there. But because Schliemann was looking for evidence of the Trojan War, he just dug straight through all the upper levels of the site and destroyed them as he went. That's Victorian archaeology for you. He dug right through, all the way down through the layers, until he reached Troy II, which was destroyed by fire and which he believed was Homer's Troy. Which is logical enough, if the Trojan War is an historical event, in the story it is destroyed by fire. Obviously the story is that uh, the Greeks pretend to have left or died of plague, um, and then they leave this giant wooden horse outside the city, and the Trojans think that the horse is a gift from the gods, and they, and they take the horse into the city, and then at night the Greeks jump out of the horse where they have been hiding, or possibly some Greeks, depending how plausible the version is. Um, in some cases it's the entire Greek army, uh, in some cases it's one or two Greeks are in the horse, um, and they hop out and open the gates to let everybody else in, which is the more logical and plausible version of a not very plausible story. Anyway, they, they open the gates uh, and let all the rest of the Greeks in, and the Greeks overrun the city um, and destroy it uh, and burn it down. So Schliemann's suggestion that Hisarlik is Troy and that this layer that had been destroyed by fire is evidence of the Trojan War is not unreasonable, but his methods were such that he destroyed the rest of the archaeology, he severely damaged the site and the artifacts preserved there. Um, some of the artifacts may also be forgeries. Uh, this is a famous picture of his wife Sophia wearing the Jewels of Helen um, jewellery that was apparently found at the site and that he said belonged to Helen of Troy slash Sparta, um, but some of these may be forgeries even. Of course, archaeologists have gone back in the years since and <laughs> had another look at the site and done what they can around what Schliemann destroyed um, in the quest for Troy. The site itself is a small circular mound which was occupied from about 3000 BCE to about 1200 CE, but not necessarily continuously. There's evidence for over 46 building phases at the site, and they are grouped conventionally into nine bands. We cannot know if this is the Troy referred to by Homer, or if it's ancient Wailusha, um, but it does fit the rough geographical region, and there are ruins dating from the Greek Bronze Age, from you know, 1200 to 1100, the point where the war would have taken place. Troy 6 was destroyed by an earthquake, Troy 7a was destroyed by fire, evidence for Troy 7b is slim and we're not sure how it came to an end, and Troy 7b2 was not fortified and therefore does not fit the Troy of the Trojan War. So the one that's most likely ancient Troy, if this, if the story of the Trojan War is accurate, is Troy 7a. So it is very likely that there was a conflict between some Greek city-states, possibly Mycenae and Sparta, and the Hittite city of Wailusha. There may have been an alliance of Greeks coming to attack Wailusha, there may have been a siege, and it may have been destroyed by fire as a result. So in that sense, Yes, the Trojan War did really happen, most likely, but the details of the story are much less likely to be true or accurate. Whatever Herodotus thought, the chances of somebody dragging hundreds of men to war across the sea because one man's wife were taken are pretty slim. Uh, the 2004 movie made it a kind of excuse for a war that for political reasons people wanted anyway, which does make some kind of sense. An alliance of Greek city-states attacking Wailusha is certainly not impossible, but the idea that it's over somebody's wife seems rather unlikely. And the chances of a city being stupid enough to take a wooden horse with room for even one man inside it into their city at the end of a ten-year siege when the enemy has mysteriously disappeared, it does not matter how religious a people are. Leaders and generals do not become leaders and generals by being stupid. <laughs> this is just not plausible. It is slightly more plausible if it's one or two people, but even then, it is not plausible that after ten years of siege, the leaders and the generals of Wailusha went, oh, the Greeks all vanished overnight and they've left us a present, let's take it into the city, leave it unguarded and lock the doors. 
Some people think that the horse story might have been inspired by the way ancient siege engines were covered in horse hide to stop them being set on fire, in which case, and in, in a historical war, it may just be that the Greeks had a big siege engine and, and that's how they got into the city and, and ended the siege. <laughs> and that would be the real Trojan horse. Other suggestions it involves smuggling men and horses in in some other more plausible way, a back entrance or a tunnel or something, or it's just because horses and war horses were important to the Hittites, the Trojans. So did the Trojan War really happen? Yes and no. The details of the story, the details of the Trojan War cycle of myths are very unlikely to be accurate. But was there a war between a group of Greeks and Hittites in Wailusha? Very probably, yes. If you enjoyed this video, please do give it a like and subscribe to my channel for myth, legend, folklore, ghost stories, witchcraft, and weird and wonderful history in general. Until next time, bye.